What is the best gaming CPU? It's a big question, but what does it even mean? Is it the best processor? Is it the one that's the most affordable? Does it give you the most amount of frames per second? If you are feeling a little bit confused, then I honestly don't blame you because it is a very daunting situation and depending on who you ask, you're gonna get different answers. So what we're doing here today is gathering four of the very best gaming CPUs that are completely modern and that you can actually buy right now. But ultimately, we're gonna be looking at performance. What differences do these make to the games that you actually want to play? and ultimately what is going to be the right decision for you. So buckle your seatbelts, it's going to be one heck of an informative ride. Stay tuned after a short word from this video sponsor. Are you ready for the next generation of PC gaming? Seagate's hosting a global gaming event on the 24th of June, and it's one you'll not want to miss. You'll get to see firsthand the future of PCIe Generation 4 storage, GPUs, calling tech, and much, much more. I honestly can't wait. We'll be hearing from the likes of CD Projekt Red, AMD, Razer, and MSI. It's going to be huge. So set yourself a reminder with that link down below, put your feet up, and then enjoy the very best that PC gaming has to offer. So okay then, you've probably heard the term gaming CPU before, but what do we actually mean? Well, realistically, there's nothing special about a gaming CPU, it is just a computer processor. The way they earn this gaming term, however, is pretty much just all about price to performance, because as a gamer, we want to spend as much money as possible on the graphics card. And in theory, we want to spend as little on the processor as possible, because ultimately this isn't going to net us really high frame rates, whereas the graphics card normally is. However, on the contrary, if you don't spend enough on your processor, then what will happen is that your lovely graphics card won't actually be able to work to its full potential, and you might be sitting at 60, 70, 80% GPU utilization, and you'll find that you've quite literally got lost FPS sitting on the table. This is what's known as CPU bottlenecking, and where possible, it's something you want to try to avoid. Don't get me wrong, you are always going to have a bottleneck in your system. You're pretty much working with the lowest common denominator. You want to make sure that you're pretty much matching the graphics card with the CPU, not only for today, but so if you want to upgrade in the future, you're not having to upgrade everything just to get more performance. Let us introduce all of the CPUs in our test, which quite by chance actually is half Intel and half Ryzen. How about that for neutrality? At the lower end, and the cheapest chip they actually have in our test here today, this is the Core i5-11400F. And that F is actually really important because it means that this doesn't have any form of integrated graphics inside it, which might sound like a bad thing, but actually all it means is that you're going to save around about 20-30 pounds on your processor. The i5 is a 6-core chip, which obviously isn't the highest that you can get right now, but for a gaming PC, it's pretty much all you really need at the moment. Stepping up a tad, we do actually have to move over to Team Red. Here we have the Ryzen 5, 5600X, but it is still six cores, which could be limiting in certain titles, and ultimately because this costs you more money, is this actually going to translate into better real-world performance? Remember, that is cash that you could spend on a better graphics card. Moving on to option three, and going back to Intel, this is the Core i7-11700F. And to me, this is an incredibly exciting CPU, and one that I would strongly consider buying for my own personal gaming rig. And the reason is because this now has eight cores, yet it's not actually that much more expensive than a 5600X. Well, what if you're not willing to give anything up? What if you want it all? What if you're greedy? Then you're gonna wanna grab one of these, the Ryzen 7 5800X. Eight cores is more than the average gamer will ever need, and you get that perfect blend of strong single core performance for gaming with maybe a little bit extra longevity. Obviously, you can spend even more on a CPU if you like, and it would still be a good gaming CPU. The Ryzen 5900X, for instance, is a great option, but if you are looking to build a dedicated gaming PC, then one of these is probably gonna be your best bet. To assess exactly how good these CPUs are, we have grabbed the latest 3080 Ti from Nvidia as pretty much a worst case scenario. Obviously most people are not buying this, but of course we're trying to expose any limitations with the CPUs, so we need as much GPU horsepower as possible to essentially take that out of the equation. We will of course be using two different systems as we need two separate motherboards, one for Intel and one for AMD. We will be using the same memory for each system though, as we want to keep things as fair as possible. We're using 16 gigabytes at 3600 megahertz. We start with the low end and work our way up. So this is the i5-11400F. And don't discount him, just because he is the cheapest of the bunch doesn't mean the performance in certain titles isn't going to be the same as the others. I think there are going to be some surprise results here. To make sure that it is a fair test, we'll turn XMP on and make sure that resizable bar is enabled for all of our graphics cards and all of our CPUs. Resize... would help if I could spell. Resize bar support enabled. 
We will of course use the latest graphics card driver for all of our graphics cards, and in terms of the games that we'll be testing, we've got Apex Legends, Modern Warfare, Warzone, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and of course Cyberpunk with some RTX effects. We're going to start with everybody's favourite game, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, not because it's the most fun thing in the world, but because it is the most scientific. This is a proper benchmark, it runs from start to finish, and in theory, if you're going to get any variance, this is the thing that's going to be the least reduced. So currently we've got 94 FPS with a 3080 Ti with a CPU that costs around about £150 and in terms of bottlenecking we're not seeing any and in fact it does actually say here we're 99% GPU bound so if you'd spent a load more money on a 5800X you probably wouldn't see any difference but don't get too excited as as we turn it down to 1440p and 1080p I have a strong feeling that that figure is going to change Oh, there's so much benchmarking to do you guys are so lucky you're about to be given the information in the next few minutes I've got to wait here for the next few hours. But I'm not complaining, I'm British. We never do that. Here we go, more figures, more figures. We love figures, what are we gonna see? GPU bound, 40%. So there you go. It only took 1440p to topple the 3080 and the 11400F. It wasn't ever gonna be a combination most people would go for, I hope, but it's interesting nonetheless. Place your bets now, don't cheat. Let me know down in the comment section below how GPU bound is this going to be at 1080p? If I was to bet, I'd say 13%, but maybe I'm way off. Let me know. What are we going to get? Oh, <laughs> 0%, 0% GPU bound. Oh, Core i5, we've pushed you to the limits, haven't we? Let's move on to our ray traced title, Cyberpunk 2077. We take a one minute benchmark, walking in a straight line, which doesn't sound that fun, and it's not. It really is quite astounding just how much of a difference the resolution makes, because at 4K, once again, with this CPU, our GPU utilization is around about 98%, so this pretty much would perform the same as any of the others. The easiest way to explain it, if you like, is that let's say the CPU can run Cyberpunk at 90 frames a second, well, the graphics card is currently outputting 63, so the CPU doesn't have a problem. But if we turn this down to 1080p, and let's say the frame rate shot up to 150 frames a second, then you're then going to be limited by the CPU that can only do that lower amount of FPS. It's not that it's easier to drive, it's just that you hit that bottleneck a lot sooner at 1080p than at 4K. Up next is some Apex Legends, your favourite game according to the comments, and this is an interesting one because we are actually hitting a hard wall, but that is actually more of an in-game frame rate cap of 300 frames a second, which is pretty interesting for a couple of reasons really. Firstly, if you do decide to buy a 3080 Ti and run this at 1080p, then I don't think that's the best use of your money, personally. But then secondly, because there doesn't really seem to be any issues with that CPU, I'm not sure if I expected as much. But it goes to show that when you think how many people play a game like Apex Legends and that is their game, that's what they choose to play, and this is able to drive 300 frames a second, I don't really think that gives you much of a cause for concern. Obviously, if you do want to play more intense things and you want it to last longer, then yes, bear this in mind. But if you have a game in mind and you can hit the frame rate cap with a CPU, then happy days. If there ever was to be a game that was a bit more problematic though, then I think Call of Duty Warzone probably would be it. I mean, at 1080p, just look at that CPU utilization, around about 70%. We've almost got like a seesawing match going on between the graphics card and the processor, and it's not really clear who the winner would be. We now have completed our first row, which means it's now time to actually take this CPU out and move on to the slightly beefier 8-core i7. I'm expecting quite literally bigger things from this, but I guess only time will tell. But how CPU bound are we gonna be with this better CPU? And the answer is actually quite surprising. We're quite CPU bound, 53% CPU bound to be exact, as here it says 47% on the GPU, and I'm doing some quick maths for you there. So it goes to show that even if you do wanna spend, what, 300 pounds potentially on a CPU, in certain titles, it's still not necessarily going to be enough. I honestly can't wait to see the numbers for the 5600X and the 5800. Are the Ryzen's going to be able to topple Shadow of the Tomb Raider or is Lara Croft going to win? Will it be the rise of the Tomb Raider or will the CPUs live in the shadow of the Tomb Raider? I'm here all week.
In order to test our Ryzen CPUs, we are actually going to need to have a slightly different computer. Not really too much has changed. We've got pretty much the same amount of cooling on each. We do obviously have an air cooler rather than an all-in-one, but don't let that put you off because we're not actually testing thermals. And both of these are going to be more than sufficient to properly cool our CPU. So while we can't actually uh, compare the exact temperature numbers, it's not going to get in the way of good results. The first processor that we'll be testing is the 5600X. So again, six cores, but ridiculously strong single core performance. I would actually say that the results are quite surprising because the Ryzen 5 is better than the 11400F. There is no doubt about that at all. But when you think about the value, there's not actually such a huge difference between the two chips. Call of Duty Warzone is probably the most interesting test that we have here today, as there is a strong case for the 5600X when you compare it to the i5. At 1080p, I think we're getting around about 14 more FPS on average, which is pretty good. But then when you compare it to the i7, that isn't actually that much more expensive, that is a chip that is still outperforming this. So there's definitely a lot to think about here. T-shirt change because it's actually a new day. I finished with the first three CPUs, which just leaves the final one, the 5800X. Interestingly, the results don't seem to be too different from the i7. I'd say that I probably expected to see maybe a little bit more performance, but they are both eight core chips at the end of the day, and they both are targeted really towards gaming and single threaded applications. So I guess I'm not really massively surprised. The only thing to report is that for some strange reason in cyberpunk it just really doesn't like this ryzen pc and both the chips actually got around about 70 fps on the absolute maximum even if we turned ray tracing and things like that off so there's definitely something a little bit strange going on there so sadly cyberpunk is going to have to be removed from these tests we've got them all of the results which means it's time to hand you over to your favorite chap not me sadly pc centric's a bit yesterday's news it's all about Bench Marcus. Not Benchmark Marcus, remember? Sadly, he passed away. Wasting absolutely no time and jumping straight in, the first thing really that you need to know is that at 4K, every single one of these CPUs performed more or less the same. This isn't to say that this would be the case in every title in the next five years or so, but for now, it's a pretty safe bet that all of these gaming CPUs will have you covered. Even in Cyberpunk, something that is a little bit weird, but still very demanding, there wasn't an issue at all. However, if you turn the settings down to 1440p or lower, this is when you do start to see the big differences between the CPUs. Now, COD Warzone is definitely the most demanding game for the CPU that we have here in our tests, and this is clearly where you can see all of the differences between the CPUs. But of course, do bear in mind that this isn't a test to see which is the best CPU. Obviously, the more expensive one is going to perform better. This is all about relative performance and trying to match a graphics card to a processor. Are any of these numbers too low for you, or are you surprised that actually they are fairly similar despite the what? 150 pound difference between the i5 and the Ryzen 7? I think that's quite impressive. The 1080p numbers, meanwhile, definitely separate the wheat from the chaff. As here, despite the fact that Apex Legends is again the same across the board, all of the other games really do start to see a big difference, and that i5 does start to struggle, especially in Call of Duty Warzone. But again, remember not everyone's using an RTX 3080 Ti. If your graphics card can't actually render this amount of FPS anyway, then clearly all of these CPUs are going to perform exactly the same when it comes to real-world performance. And here you can really see, despite the fact that the 5800X is the better CPU, in terms of value for gaming, it's definitely nowhere near as good as the i5 or even the i7. I think actually the i7 is going to be a brilliant choice for most people, really, because you're getting the benefit of eight cores, but still great performance. But obviously there are loads of different factors at play. Do remember that this is an RTX 3080 Ti, and the purpose of this was to see the limits of these CPUs. If you're spending two, 300 pounds on a graphics card, assuming I guess things go a little bit back to normal and you can buy a mainstream GPU, then obviously it doesn't really matter quite so much, if at all, because when you think Apex Legends actually performed the same on each of these CPUs, we were able to get pretty much 300 FPS at 1080p, it's all going to depend on what you want to play and what graphics card you're actually going to use. Don't go looking at these figures and thinking, oh, just because the 5800X performs the best, that's the chip that I need to go for. The lesson here is to always be very careful when shopping for your CPU, because there are so many different factors at play, but ultimately you want the best performance possible. So you need to look at your budget and allocate it to the graphics card and the CPU in order to get the most performance. And that is quite a difficult thing to do, but as the data here shows, if you're looking to play at a higher resolution, then clearly as much money as possible should go towards the graphics card. But if 
you're looking to maybe do 360 hertz gameplay, you are prepared to get the best graphics card possible, then you are going to need the best CPU. For most people, you're going to sit somewhere in the middle of those two groups where you want to be able to do a little bit of everything. And I think that pretty much all of the chips that we have on the table here today are going to serve you very, very well. Just be careful with that baseline i5 because it is going to be great for most people. But if you really do want to pair it with something super high end, then I'd say it's not really going to be enough. But ultimately, if you're spending a load of money on a 3080 Ti, playing at 1080p probably wasn't on your to-do list anyway. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you do want to check out current pricing or more information on any of these CPUs, I'll link them all down below with my Amazon affiliate links. But smash that like button if you've enjoyed this, it really does help out. Get yourself subscribed for more videos just like this. And if you haven't had enough PC-centric, you can find more videos in the end screen, including the full build guides for both of these PCs. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.